Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is my good friend and colleague, Elena Love. Welcome, Elena. So, Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Great. I'll tell you all about Elena in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is the show that deals with what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, compassion we exert for others. And when you do it as a leader, as you will discover that Elena very much is, you do it with a passion and a purpose to bring people together for common cause. Welcome, Elena. Love. So, Thank you, John. It's great to see you. Great. And it, uh, special shout out because Elena is a second time guest, but she was my very, very first guest when I did this first show back in June of 2020. So I'm in debt to you, my friend. So <laughs> It was fun then. It's going to be fun now, John. You've great. been doing great work. I've been watching, by the way. The shows are terrific. Thank you. Um, Elena is the CEO of Purpose Link Consulting um, and the developer of a very, very powerful instrument called the Passion Profiler. I have taken it and uh, I'm one of the few people that actually flunked it. Uh, no, seriously, <laughs> it's a great tool and she'll tell you about it. Um, Elena has been um, I'm, uh, a longtime HR executive and now she runs her own business. She worked for a senior, uh, I'm sorry, she was the executive director for HR for Merck and ran the HR practice. And she worked in the field of immunology, which gosh, I think that's a little relevant these days. She's the co-author of the Purpose Linked Organization, and which has um, captured her research in an exciting way. She's a regular contributor to um, a Smart Brief Leadership. Elena, it's wonderful to have you on the show again. So, Thanks again. I'm looking forward to digging in today. We've got some good things to talk about, John. Yes, we do. Um, Elena, you're out in the world with executives. I know you were just in D.C. and you delivered a keynote to a sort of <laughs> an empty auditorium, but it was full of virtual people there, So, which is kind of the um, uh, uh, tenor of our time. So you're out with executives and work with senior leaders. What are you hearing about where we are right now? you know, two years into this pandemic. So. People are exhausted. I mean, there, it clearly people wish this could all be over. And, you know, there was great hope that when we all got vaccinated, we'd be able to go back to quote unquote normal, whatever that looks like. But I think that we're also seeing um, a period of time where leaders are absolutely fatigued, really fatigued, because I think they've been carrying the ball around, uh, around this issue for a very long time. And as someone told me recently, I didn't learn about this in B school. You know, this wasn't something that I was ever prepared to handle. And I've heard other people say to me, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> Just a second. When is this going to stop? So I think we really have to, um, as folks who work with executives, be thinking about how do we keep their energy up? Because we're, this is this is not a, a sprint. It's a marathon. It's going to be a while that, as we navigate through this and help people understand how to manage each part of this experience as it unfolds. I'm going to see kind of, that's great. And I, I agree. I'm going to see kind of a curveball question. So um, I just I don't disagree at all about the exhaustion, the weariness. Um, I feel it. Uh, I know executives do. But if we stand back, we say, well, wait a minute. Uh, um, executives, like many of us, are working virtually or maybe in a hybrid. So we don't go into the office as much as we used to, if at all. So what's to be tired about, Elena? <laughs> Well, you know, think back on when this all started. I remember having to work with the team. Um, there was a request to do an important session with a team uh, of about 60 people. And I realized normally I would be in front of the group of people and I can feel their energy. I can read body language. I can see what's going on. I can have those small moments in the hallway to connect with them and talk further to really dig in with what's going on. All of that was gone. I was going to have to connect with 60 faces across the screen. And I think leaders are facing that same thing. They're, they're, they're managing um, in a virtual environment, many of them, or, or a combination of sometimes I get to be with people in the office, sometimes I don't. There's still this air of caution about how we interact with one another. So we don't have the same you know, degrees of familiarity that we would normally have. We're not hanging out with each other, you know, fist bumping and sharing a cup of coffee right next to your, you know, a work colleague the way you used to. 
And I think that they're also in a situation where when you're dealing with the issues that we've dealt with over the last couple of years, you have come to know your people differently. You've come to know not just who they are in the work environment, but their whole lives and everything they're trying to manage. You remember all the times when people would turn on their Zoom screen and we'd see the cat walking across or the baby would be crying or the dogs barking as mine may well do while we're on this, <laughs> this session. Today. It's um, live TV. It's a live TV, right? And we really got to know people at that level. And so there's, as a leader, there's a sense of responsibility now, not just for the individual, but for all the people in their lives that they carry that are part of how they exist. And it, I think it has ratcheted up the sense of ownership that leaders have for the experience that their people are having every single day, some of which they can't control because it's 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 not in front of them. It's not like right. you walk into a building and there it is and I can control that space. You know, you said something very interesting. I like the way you phrased it. I mean, you talked about the energy of people. And so often, and, you know, three years ago, you would have said, <laughs> I'm tired of this, you know, the, of people, I need to get away and things like that. And that's why we have something called vacations. Mm -hmm. but, but there is true energy, as you spoke about. I know just the other day I gave a keynote and it was in a hybrid environment, but I was virtual. And so <laughs> I have to bring my energy level up, but mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm communicating to a camera lens. Uh, <laughs> so, and there's no feedback from the audience and that's exhausting. And yes. I'm just doing it, you know, uh, on a temporary thing. Um, but um, imagine day after day doing that, that is exhausting. So it is, it requires that you have great imagination of who the other faces are on the other side of that camera lens. And come across at, at your most earnest level to be able to have them feel you, even though they're not in the room with you. So it does require an extra level of diligence from the, the communicator and especially from leaders. Now, so much of the work that you have done for so long um, is revolves around purpose. Would you say that the pandemic has had an effect on our purpose? Um, uh, Elena? Sorry. I would say that the, the, the pandemic effect on purpose has been tremendous, tremendous. In fact, in all the years I've been doing this work, I have never seen such a groundswell of interest and willingness to converse on this issue as I have seen in the last couple of years. In fact, when I started talking about purpose and passion early on, I had a demand creation problem. People wanted to talk to me about it, but behind closed doors and whispered, certainly not out in the broad light of day. Now, I think this pandemic has evoked in all of us this sense of, wait a minute, you mean I could die from this virus and I could die way sooner than I thought I was going to? And it's brought people face to face with their own mortality in a way that they're beginning to ask the question, am I doing the things with my life that I should be doing? If these were my last days, is this how I would have wanted to have spent them? Right. And is there a sense of, of purpose that I have for where I'm going directionally going forward? So I think it has really raised that question big time for a lot of people. And that then also offers another challenge to leaders. How right. do you start being the solution to the purpose that people are seeking who work for I think it's I think it's one of the things which has affected what we call the great resignation. However, mm -hmm. the numbers in the great resignation very often refer to people, they're not leaving the workplace, they're changing jobs and they're making more in their jobs. Hooray, hooray. But there is a portion, and I don't know what the numbers are, but just what you said, it's kind of like, is this all there is? And mm -hmm. so do I, do I really want to be the vice president of marketing or do I really want to have an office in the sweet suite or is there something better for me? Are you hearing that, Elena? So. I am. In fact, it dovetails um, perfectly with the re research I've been doing over the last number of years on this issue, um, which which mirrors uh, what's, what what uh, positive psychologists would call the U-shaped curve of happiness. In the U-shaped curve of happiness, they say, you know, when we're 18 to 20, 24 years old, we're on the high end of the curve, we're feeling pretty happy. And then we start taking this dip down as we enter our 20s and we trough out in our 50s and we start coming back up the other side of the curve in our 60s and beyond and we attain a, you know, ongoing level of happiness. Because what happens as we get older is that we begin naturally to search for meaning over money. So meaning becomes the, the, the thing we seek and the things that we involve ourselves with are things that give us a sense of fulfillment and meaning. 
Whereas huh. earlier in our careers, we may be chasing, uh, you know, the almighty financial reward for what we're doing and uh, buying a house and, you know, having a family and that sort of thing to be preoccupied with. That. Well, very so, much. So. It's, it's having a family. I mean, <laughs> that's when kids come and you're a mom of, of a grown yeah. son, a very accomplished son, I will say, um, you know, that takes a lot of energy. And so and good, all good things. But when yeah. um, our kids leave the house um, and which is good, we want them to. Um, right. We have more time for ourselves. And so then we begin to wonder where we are. So that's all part of the natural. But I think, you know, as you said, if we confront our mortality as we do the when we age, but what else is that we want to do? What more? And, you know, um, our, and, and, but also there's something else, I think, and you and I have talked about this before, and it's the social justice. You know, we are in a country which is divided terribly so. And, um, and so people are saying, well, can I get involved or what should I do? Are, are you hearing that, Elena? So. Absolutely, I'm hearing that. I think, I think, you know, just to continue the thought that we were, we were discussing previously, you're right. We do naturally as we, as we age you know, look for more meaning. At least the data shows us that. But what I'm also finding through my research is that at about age 32, we start having a very different discussion with ourselves about where we're headed and what we're doing and does it matter? What's mm -hmm. happened is that this pandemic has spread out that to other age categories that it normally mm -hmm. wouldn't be happening to at that phase of the game. So you do have people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and beyond looking for meaning. And meaning includes things like social justice it, you know it, do i am i supporting the things that i think are important in my life and in this country or in in the community that, that i'm a part of am i willing to stand up and demonstrate courage of conviction especially if i see injustices occurring um and and that provides people with a sense of meaning when they are um, engaging in activities that put us to a more socially just uh, world than than we have been in so yeah i'm yeah. seeing that as well if there's a good news story to that, I think what we're seeing is our children, um, high school and collegiate, whatever they are, um, they've embraced this fully. And it's kind of like they look at us and, and it's like, what's taken you so long? Or And I find hope in that. And But also they've been tested very, uh, very hard in this pandemic. And I, I um, think they will come out stronger. Um, do you have that sense? Um, I, I have a feeling that they'll come out stronger depending upon what age they were when they went into this. I mm -hmm. think we're going to be listening to psychologists and social scientists talk about the studies on the effect of this pandemic on children for decades, eons to come. Um, I don't think we, the book on that has been written yet, but I certainly do think we have a cohort of individuals who are either about to enter the workforce or who are in the workforce now who are saying we want something better we're willing to fight for the something better. They've been raised by people who have said to them, find your passions and make that a career for yourself. And they've taken it seriously, so seriously. It's not just find your passions and make a career, but they're, they're, they're operating with the notion of, I'm gonna find my passions and build my life around it. So That's the contract that they have with the employer is very different now than it was 20 years ago. You. Thank you. I want to drill down and you work at the nexus of passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. Does one come before another or do they, how does, how do you view them, uh, Elena? It's, it's an interesting interrelationship. When I think about purpose and passion and the interconnectedness between the two, I think of purpose as being at the core of everything, the core of who you are. And based on my research, it seems to, to, to indicate that we come into the world with this sense of purpose. We spend our lives trying to figure out what it is, maybe trying to articulate it in some way, but it's kind of a deep hard wiring that we carry. Over time, we begin to demonstrate passions and those passions are birthed from that purpose. They're sort of the outward expression of the deeper purpose that we carry. And so what I tell people who say, I wanna find my purpose is to actually focus on your passions. Your passions are kind of the GPS that'll kind of give you a sense of the things that you can engage in that will allow you to practice your purpose as often as you engage in those things. So coming to some eloquent statement about my purpose in life as X can be very, very difficult. But if you start to get in touch with your passions and really follow 
the opportunities that allow you to use those passions, you'll feel that you're living a purposeful existence. Right. That's just great. And I, I did an article in which for Smart Brief, in which I quoted you, but it was based on something from um, <clears throat> an, uh, actually a novelist and nonfiction writer, but former Marine, Elliot Ackerson, talked about that so many combat veterans um, feel their greatest sense of, he used the word passion or purpose, in, in, in extremists, which is almost to be expected. And so when one leaves that environment, it's kind of like, what else am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that maybe that we, I argue that we redefine our purpose, but might you say we are rediscovering passions or finding new passion? What would you say about that, yeah. Alina? What so. I would say is that if we understand our passions, we have a chance to utilize those passions in myriad ways throughout our lifetime. And every time we do, we're living our purpose. And it may not look the same today as it will look 20 years from now, but every time we're utilizing those passions, we are expressing that purpose in what we're doing. I do some work with um, a, an organization called Academy Women. They're dedicated to military women. Many of them have uh, graduated from the um, service academies. And very often um, they're dealing with women who are in career transition. They hold a career uh, workshop every year. And I've been speaking at that workshop for probably the past five years or so. And repeatedly, I've gotten letters from attendees uh, at that workshop who have said, before I came and listened and understood this concept of the link between purpose and passion, I thought that when I left the military, I would have no more opportunity to express my purpose. My purpose was finished. And now what? And I was feeling lost. I was, you know, feeling like, the, what's the point? Where's the next opportunity for, for, for fulfillment? But now I understand that I can use my purpose as I did in the military in one way, express it in one way through my passions. I can take those same passions and apply them to something else that's different, but it will still feel like I'm being purposeful in my life. And so right. that's the cool thing to, to, to realize. You're never finished, John. It's not one thing you do and then, okay, all done. Put my feet up. I, I'm coming to a quote where we talked, I think it's, many people have used it, but in, um, it's about um, uh, that, about character. And it said, adversity doesn't make character, reveals character. Mm -hmm. well, I think you could argue from what you say about passion and purpose that, um, situations, be it a crisis or just life, reveals our purpose in different ways. Does that make sense? So. It, does, it does make sense. I think different life circumstances give us a chance to practice our purpose, to be, to be in the state of purpose. And what, oh, our, our big challenge is recognizing what our passions are, recognizing where they can be applied. And when we recognize where they can be applied, we discover in those arenas places where we can demonstrate our purpose over and over and over again. To me, the exciting part of it is that there's so many opportunities to be who you are and be living on purpose. And it makes me feel hopeful because it doesn't feel like there's a one limited kind of thing I have to do. And I'm only here for that one thing and I have no other value to the world. I will continue to have value as long as I'm breathing and as long as I can contribute those <laughs> that's a good You know, and, and um, that's such a powerful statement, but for some folks, they'll say, well, you know, that's good for you, Elaine, or that's good for you, John, but how do I find my purpose? And this brings me to you. You have a wonderful instrument called the Passion Profile. P profiler. How does that work, Elena? Well, the Passion Profiler was an instrument that I created really out of a personal need. I was at that juncture in my life where I was wondering, should I continue doing what I was doing? Should I do something else? Didn't feel a sense of purpose in the work I was doing, even though I was good at it. And when I, when I made the decision to leave the role that I was in and start my own business, I looked around and asked myself, what could have helped me navigate this decision in a better way? What, where could I have found information that could help me understand my purpose? And I found that there wasn't anything out there. And then I began to realize that purpose and passions were connected because I started working and interviewing high performing people. And I always noticed that they demonstrated a set of passions over and over and over again. And every time they demonstrated those passions, their faces would light up 
They'd feel this sense of accomplishment. They'd feel this sense of fulfillment and meaning in their lives. And I thought, if I can figure out how to measure that, we're on to something. So that's what I ended up doing. I worked with a team of researchers from the University of Michigan, and we put together an instrument called the Passion Profiler, which basically tells you how you resonate with 10 distinct, what we call passion archetypes, all of us have all 10 in us to greater or lesser degrees, but the trick is really understanding what are your top three? Because your top three is kind of your, you know, sort of your internal barometer for determining whether or not what I'm about to do is going to give me an outlet to use those passions or not. And when, when it is, you're probably going to feel excited and happy about doing that particular thing. That's that activity. I like the way you phrase that because that's so often when people who feel adrift or doing something, they're given a task or in a new position where they can really practice like this is really what I was meant to do. They just blossom. They just floor. And I'm, yeah, when I see people who are passionate, probably like you, John, they change the job, right? They bring something to the job that wasn't there in the beginning and they change the job and everybody else around them. Like, you know, that's a virus you want to catch, right? You want to be around people who are super passionate because whatever yeah. they have, you want it to rub off on you. Absolutely. That's interesting because I interviewed very recently uh, Liz Weissman on her new book called Impact Player. And your description of that parallels what she was talking about. Impact players are those that see organizational need and fulfill it, maybe in unorthodox ways, but they get things done and they bring and, and things work. And one that resonated to me is um, a surgeon, surgical tech who was basically revered and all the docs wanted him on all the docs wanted him on their cases because he just had this intuitive sense of what was necessary. So that person is not a doesn't have a title, but wields significant influence and has organized things differently. So. Absolutely. You can lead at every level. Absolutely. So as we think about um, what do you think the lasting effect of the pandemic will be? Um, positive, negative. So. Well, I think the positive uh, lasting effect will be that it has tested us and shown us that we're capable of much more than we thought possible. I think and I think there's a real sense of capability that you receive from that realization. Like I didn't think, I didn't know how to do, you know, half the things I'm doing two years ago that I know how to do now. And I figured my way out of tough situations that I didn't expect to have to ever face. So we've, we've learned we've got more resilience than perhaps we thought. You know, I'm so glad you say that because that's something I like to talk about. And I've stolen this concept from Eileen McDarg, who talks about resilience. And I always thought of resilience, and I think it is a bending, not breaking. But you come through an experience like we're all doing. Um, you are transformed. Mm -hmm. And and just as you said, and uh, I was talking to an audience the other day, I said, celebrate what you've achieved. Um, you may not think it, but you've survived. And not only survived, you've thrived. Yes. And, we, and I loved how you put this, we are more capable of what we thought we were. And that's something crisis teaches us. So. And I would suggest, John, it's not just bending, but not breaking. It's, it's bending and growing. That's exactly. exactly what we've all done through this experience, I think. We've grown. Great. And and so understanding and our um and then I think the purpose is becomes our lodestone and focuses in the in the right direction. And um it's you know um I, I like to, you know, it's not a pleasant time for employers when they think of great resignation because they want to hold on to employ, uh, employees. But what do you, so if, if um, an executive comes to you, Elena, and says, um, how do I deal with people wanting to leave for another job? Well, what do you tell them? So I think, I think it's really important, not just for now, but for always, for leaders to be thinking, do I understand this person that's working with me? Do I understand their passions? Do I understand what they want to accomplish in the world, in their lives? And am I providing any of that opportunity in what I'm asking them to do? Because if you are, if you're providing with them with an opportunity to use their skill set, you're providing them with an opportunity to express and utilize their passions in the roles that you've carved out for them, and you're putting them in an environment where their values are honored, 
it will be hard to recruit them away. It will be hard to recruit them away. I mean, we all have a baseline level of pay we expect to receive for what we're doing. But when that combination of skills, passions, and values comes together in the environment that we're in, my data, my research shows it's difficult to recruit people away from that because they feel like, I don't know if I'm going to find that. And maybe the place across the street will pay me more. But I don't know if I'll get that combination where I'm operating in that sweet spot. And there's value that that has. I like how you explore that, but that would mean actually having a conversation with your employees. Uh, would it not, Elena? <laughs> it absolutely demands that you have a conversation with your employees, many conversations with them right. and honest and, conversations. And make them know that they're, make them know, make it known that they're valued. And yes. that's just an affirmation of them uh, and who they are, what they're doing. So, um, Elena, we are racing along as we do. Whenever you and I speak, we <laughs> we speak. Um, time goes fast, is what I want to say. Okay. So, um, and you know, I always ask our guests a question about grace. Do you have one you want to share with us? So. A moment of grace that I've experienced. That's your that's your question. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a time of grace, and it could be transitory or transformative. I've, oh, I've heard so all. Good. I've heard them all. So, <laughs> so. So I think, I think there's two observations that I have about voice that I'll share with you. Um, one is that there is a connection between purpose and grace um, that I think we need to appreciate because when we're operating in our purpose, we are actually in a graceful state of being. Purpose isn't a destination. It's not an act. It's a state of being. And we are at our most graceful in that state of being when we're operating on purpose. So that would be the first observation I would make. I like that. That's good. The second is that I have, you know, I reflect almost daily on how fortunate I have been to have, a, have had a life where I've experienced many moments of grace. I mean, this conversation with you today is one of them. It's another moment of grace that I'm experiencing. We're exploring, you know, our favorite topic in our conversation today. But I, I'm, I, I'm drawn back to reflecting on uh, something that I'm writing about in the new book that I'm working on called Permission to Be. And um, I wrote a story about an aunt of mine. And this particular chapter that I was working on, which I thought was gonna be the most difficult chapter to write, is on loss, death, and rebirth. It's looking at how we use our our purpose and our passions through so, to navigate some of the most challenging times in our, in our lives. She um, was sick with congestive heart failure, didn't want anybody to know until it was really impossible for her not to share it. And she, she allowed me to navigate the last weeks of her life with her and to be sure that her wishes were fulfilled, um, how she was being cared for was structured in the way that she wanted to and on the last day of her life, we spent the entire day talking about music that she loved. I had my computer there. I was playing different pieces of music for her. We talked about who she most wanted to see when she crossed over to the other side. Um, we talked about the things that mattered most to her. And I, I sat there in absolute appreciation of the wisdom of this person who was leaving this world, had one foot in this world and one foot in the next. And she gave me permission to be her partner in that journey. And that is probably one of the greatest moments of grace in my life. Wow. And I would call that a du dual, a duality of grace. She giving to you and you giving to her. So it's mm -hmm. a, that combination together that made it so very special. Yeah. So I'm I'm eager for your new book to come. And I know you're working diligently on it and that you are being very purposeful as you pursue it. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. uh, and it you're deep. You're working hard on it. So, um, Elena, with that, I'm going to say, how can people find you? So oh, that's easy. They can um, consult my website, thepurposelink.com, or you can email me at info at thepurposelink.com. Great. Well, we will put the, your website in the notes so everybody can find it. And Elena, it's such a joy to see you uh, on the show again. And I say thank you, my friend. You have taught me much and I know you'll teach me more. So. Oh, and I've learned so much from you, John. Thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you. With that, we're out.